All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to WordFest at the Mount 2013. I'm Susan Whistler, the Executive Director of the Mount, and we are delighted to welcome you to the Amy Clampett Memorial Reading, reading featuring this year the much acclaimed and loved poet Mark Strand. This is a very special highlight of our September Literary Festival, and we've been looking forward to this for a long time. For this reading, we owe our thanks not only to Mark Strand, but to the Amy Clampett Fund, a fund of the Berkshire Taconic Community Foundation. The Amy Clampett Fund has been a longtime sponsor of our literary events, and we are deeply grateful for the partnership and support. Uh, we would also like to thank the Leon Lowenstein Foundation, as well as Blantyre, which has generously provided lodging for all of our festival participants. I would also like to acknowledge TweetSpeak, an online poetry publication. And last but certainly not least, I would like to thank our festival director, Christine Triantos, who has done another wonderful job of some really exciting events. So, Christine, thank you. <laughs> After the reading, uh, we hope that you will stay and join us for a reception and book signing, which will happen in the carriage wash uh, right behind these doors. And we are also thrilled tonight to have with us Mary Jo Salter, who is a poet and trustee of the Amy Clampett Fund. Mary Jo will be providing us with a little background on the, the Berkshire poet Amy Clampett, in whose name uh, the Amy Clampett Fund was created. And um, she will also be introducing Mr. Strand. Mary Jo is the author of seven books of poetry, all published by Knopf, most recently Nothing by Design, which was released just this week. She's a frequent rev reviewer and essayist, and she is also a lyricist, children's book author, and playwright. She's the editor of the Selected Poems of Amy Clampett and is co-editor of the Norton Anthology of Poetry. Mary Jo became a permanent member of the writing seminars faculty at Johns Hopkins in 2007 after a very long and distinguished career at, at Mount Holyoke College. So please join me in welcoming Mary Jo Salter. Thank you, Susan. I'm so glad to be asked by the Mount uh, to introduce Mark Strand to you this afternoon. And as Susan said, I, I wanted to say a few words about the poet Amy Clampett, after whom this reading at the Mount is named. Amy Clampett was born in Providence, Iowa in 1920 and died here in Lenox in, in 1994. An editor in New York City for most of her life, she published five books of poems in her lifetime, but didn't publish the first one until she was 63 years old. That first book, The Kingfisher, published by Alfred Knopf in 1983, made her suddenly famous, at least in the way that poets are famous. Her poems appeared almost weekly, it seemed, in The New Yorker. She re received virtually every prize. She didn't like flying and she didn't drive, but mostly by taking buses, she read her work all over America before her death at the age of 74. When she won a MacArthur Genius Grant, she and her husband, Harold Korn, used it to buy a house right here in town near her poet friend, Karen Chase. I was a friend of Amy's too, as well as the editor of her posthumous collections, and I can't urge too strongly on you this passionate but highly intellectual, city-fied but bird-watching, romantic realist of a poet. I remember my pride in being able to show her around this house, a favorite, uh, the house of Edith Wharton, a favorite writer of Amy's back in, in the 1980s. How pleasing and how fitting it is to be back. For the past decade, the Amy Clampett Fund of the Berkshire Taconic Community Foundation has been keeping alive her legacy by means of this annual reading, as well as other projects, most importantly, the Amy Clampett Resident Fellowships, whereby each year a poet or poets have been living and writing in Amy's house for six to 12 months. Many careers have been jump-started and sustained in Amy's house. Books have been written in that little cottage that might not otherwise have been written. But now I'm here to tell you about a living poet who is the author of many books, whose name is practically a byword for American poetry itself. 
The books that make up Mark Strand's life work so far are both numerous and various. A dozen books of poems, three of translations, three of literary essays, three of art criticism, three for children, I think I've got these numbers right, and another handful of edited an anthologies. For this prodigious and brilliant output, he has received every prize our country bestows to poets. He's been the United States Poet Laureate, a winner of the Pulitzer Prize, a fellow of the MacArthur Foundation, a chancellor of the American Academy of Poets, et cetera, et cetera. Mr. Strand is also a visual artist and has devoted much time in recent years to the making of collages, an exhibit of these small uh, color-soaked perfections, which I have seen and, and really do recommend if you can make it there, is on view at the Laurie Bookstein Gallery in New York right now. He teaches comparative literature and English at Columbia and lives in Madrid for part of each year. I imagine Mr. Strand will, at least, will read at least some po poems from his newest book, Almost Invisible. It's very difficult to say what this new book is like. It's like what it is. Mr. Strand's work has long been concerned, but in this book seems especially concerned with the shadowy border between self and not self, one self and multiple selves, being and not being, nothing and something, writing and not writing, prose and poetry, death and life. Almost invisible is a good term for those thin borders and also perhaps for the narrator or speaker of these poems. He's sometimes so present and he is actually here to write, write to us that he has gone, died, disappeared. At other times he materializes to watch a banker walking into a brothel or a husband coming home from a long day at the office. Some poems dare to be grand and luscious, some draw upon the venerable conventions of jokes. Tone shifts a number of times within any, within any one piece, which itself makes us laugh. And like many jokes, these pieces are often dead serious conundrums. Mr. Strand dares to channel and reshape other writers, especially Wallace Stevens, but not least himself. When, in this new book, we see the poet imagining the turning point between consciousness and dream, some of us, some of us may think of his first book of poems back in 1964, sleeping with one eye open. And yet Mr. Strand is not merely recycling his previous aperçu. He is a rarity among mature artists in remaining truly youthful, inventive, playful, even as his wisdom deepens. It's a great honor to have him here at the Mount. Please welcome Mark Strand. Well, thank you very much, Mary Jo. I want to thank you. I want to thank Christine. I want to thank Amy Clampett uh, and all of you for coming. Um, I am going to read mainly from my latest book, uh, Almost Invisible, but I, I th which are really... Uh, short prose pieces. I, I didn't write them with the intention of their having been uh, thought of as uh, poems. But everybody seems to think they're poems, so I'm willing to go along with it. Um, but I thought I might read a couple of poems before, which were written with the intention of being poems. Uh, although some of you may think, are these poems? Man and Camel. On the eve of my 40th birthday, I sat on the porch having a smoke when out of the blue a man and a camel happened by. Neither uttered a sound at first, but as they drifted up the street and out of town, the two of them began to sing. Yet what they sang is still a mystery to me. The words were indistinct and the tune too ornamental to recall. Into the desert they went, and as they went, their voices rose as one above the sifting sound of wind-blown sand. The wonder of their singing, its elusive blend of man and camel, seemed an ideal image for all uncommon couples. 
Was this the night that I had waited for so long? I wanted to believe it was, but just as they were vanishing, the man and camel ceased to sing and galloped back to town. They stood before my porch, staring up at me with beady eyes and said, you ruined it, you ruined it forever. <clears throat> Cake. A man leaves for the next town to pick up a cake. On the way, he gets lost in a dense woods and the cake is never picked up. Years later, the man appears on a beach staring at the sea. I am standing on a beach, he thinks, and I am lost in thought. He does not move. The heaving sea turns black. Its waves curl and crash. Soon I will leave, he continues. Soon I will go to a nearby town to pick up a cake. I will walk in a brown and endless woods, and far away the heaving sea will turn to black, and the waves, I can see them now, will curl and crash. This is a poem called Elevator. It's in two parts. One, the elevator went to the basement. The doors opened. A man stepped in and asked if I was going up. I'm going down, I said. I won't be going up. Two. The elevator went to the basement. The doors opened. A man stepped in and asked if I was going up. I'm going down, I said. I won't be going up. I'll read one more of these poems. Mirror. A white room and a party going on. And I was standing with some friends under a large gilt-framed mirror that tilted slightly forward over the fireplace. We were drinking whiskey, and some of us, feeling no pain, were trying to decide what precise shade of yellow the setting sun turned our drinks. I closed my eyes briefly, then looked up into the mirror. A woman in a green dress leaned against the far wall. She seemed distracted. The fingers of one hand fidgeted with her necklace and she was staring into the mirror, not at me, but past me, into a space that might be filled by someone yet to arrive, who at that moment could be starting the journey which would lead eventually to her. Then, suddenly, my friend said it was time to move on. This was years ago, and though I have forgotten where we went and who we all were, I still recall that moment of looking up and seeing the woman stare past me into a place I could only imagine. And each time it is with a pang, as if just then I were stepping from the depths of the mirror into that white room, breathless and eager, only to discover too late that she is not there. Now, the main event. <laughs> well, I don't know. As, uh, as Mary Jo um, said, some of these are like jokes. Some are 
like domestic satire. Some are clearly poetical, meditative. Some are probably unclassifiable. Okay, I'm just going to read the book from beginning to end. It's a short book. I mean, I may skip one or two lousy ones along the way. But I, who knows, gazing on them now, I may fall in love with them. And A banker in the brothel of blind women. Oh, I should say that I, this is the first time in my life as a poet that I wrote the titles out before I wrote the poems. I had a list of titles. And, and then I would write some prose and I would go through the titles and say, that's a good one for this. And that's how a lot of this happened. A Banker in the Brothel of Blind Women. A banker strutted into the brothel of blind women. I am a shepherd, he announced, and blow my shepherd's pipe as often as I can. But I have lost my flock and feel that I am at a critical point in my life. I can tell by the way you talk, said one of the women that you are a banker only pretending to be a shepherd and that you want us to pity you, which we do because you have stooped so low as to try to make fools of us. My dear, said the banker to the same woman, I can tell that you are a rich widow looking for a little excitement and are not blind at all. <laughs> this observation suggests, said the woman, that you may be a shepherd after all. <laughs> for what kind of rich widow would find excitement being a whore only to end up with a banker? <laughs> Exactly, said the banker. <laughs> Bury your face in your hands. Because we have crossed the river and the wind only offers only a numb uncoiling of cold and we have meekly adapted, no longer expecting more than we had been given, nor wondering how it happened that we came to this place, we don't mind that nothing turned out as we thought it might. There is no way to clear the haze in which we live, no way to know that we have undergone another day. The silent snow of thought melts before it has a chance to stick. Where we are is anyone's guess. The gates to nowhere multiply and the present is so far away, so deeply far away. Anywhere could be somewhere. I might have come from the high country, or maybe the low country. I don't recall which. I might have come from the city, but what city, in what country, is beyond me? I might have come from the outskirts of a city in which others have come, or maybe a city from which only I have come. Who's to know? Who's to decide if it rained or the sun was out? Who's to remember? They say things are happening at the border but nobody knows which border. They talk of a hotel there where it doesn't matter if you forgot your suitcase. Another will be waiting, big enough, and just for you. Could be Blantyre. 
<laughs> no, I'm only joking. It couldn't be. Um, uh, harmony in the boudoir. After years of marriage, he stands at the foot of the bed and tells his wife that she will never know him, that for everything he says, there is more that he does not say, that behind each word he utters, there is another word, and hundreds more behind that one. All those unsaid words, he says, contain his true self which has been betrayed by the superficial self before her. So you see, he says, kicking off his slippers, I am more than what I have led you to believe I am. Oh, you silly man, says his wife, of course you are. I find that just thinking of you having so many selves receding into nothingness is very exciting. <laughs> that you barely exist as you are couldn't please me more. Clarities of the, non, of the non-existent. To have loved the way it happens in the empty hours of late afternoon. To lean back and conceive of a journey leaving behind no trace of itself. To look out from the house and see a figure leaning forward as if into the wind, although there is no wind. To see the hats of those in town discarded in moments of passion scattered over the ground, although one cannot see the ground. All this in the vague yellowing light that lowers itself in the hour before dark. None of it of value except for the pleasure it gives, enlarging an instant and finally making it seem as if it were true. And years later to come upon the same scene the figure leaning into the same wind, the same hats scattered over the same ground that one cannot see. Now, this is a rather sickly romantic poem. I mean, over the top, I just want you to know that. I don't want you to take it too seriously. Although you're sophisticated enough, I shouldn't have to remind you. <laughs> but you never know. <laughs> the old age of nostalgia. Those hours given over to basking in the glow of an imagined future, of being carried away in streams of promise by a love or a passion so strong that one felt altered forever and convinced that even the smallest particle of the surrounding world was charged with a purpose of impossible grandeur. Ah, yes, and one would look up into the trees and be thrilled by the wind-loosened river of pale gold foliage cascading down and by the high, melodious singing of countless birds. Those moments, so many, and so long ago still come back, but briefly, like fireflies in the perfumed heat of a summer night. Well, next, this one is called Dream Testicles Vanished Vaginas. <laughs> I mean, the last poem needed a corrective, I thought. Horace, the corpse, said, I kept believing that tomorrow would come and I would get up, put on my socks, my boxer shorts, go to the kitchen, make myself coffee, read the paper, and call some friends. But tomorrow came and I was not in it. Instead, 
I found myself on a powder blue sofa in a field of bright grass that rolled on forever. How awful, said Mildred, who was not yet a corpse, but in close touch with Horace. How awful to be so far away with nothing to do and without sex to distract you. I've heard that all vaginas up there, even the most open, honest, and energetic, are shut down, and that all testicles, even the most forthright and gifted, swing dreamily among the clouds like little chandeliers. <laughs> the Students of the Ineffable. What I am about to say happened years ago. I had rented a house by the sea. Each night, I sat on the porch and wished for some surge of feeling, some firelit stream of sound to lead me away from all that I had known. But one night, I climbed the hill behind the house and looked down on a small dirt road where I was surprised to see long lines of people shuffling into the distance. Their difficult breathing and their coughing were probably caused by the cloud of dust their march had created. Who are you and why is this happening? I asked one of them. We are believers and must keep going. And then he added, our work is important and concerns the self. But all your dust is darkening the stars, I said. Nay, nay, he said. We are only passing through. The stars will return. The Everyday Enchantment of Music a rough sound was polished until it became a smoother sound, which was polished until it became music. Then the music was polished until it became the memory of a night in Venice when tears of the sea fell from the Bridge of Sighs, which in turn was polished until it ceased to be, and in its place stood the empty house of a heart in trouble. Then suddenly there was the sun and the music came back and traffic was moving and off in the distance at the edge of the city a long line of clouds appeared and there was thunder which however menacing would become music and the memory of what happened after Venice would begin and what happened after the home of the troubled heart broken too would also begin. Well, I mean, um, I'm just, I, I have nothing to say about these prose pieces. So I'm I, uh, I just going to keep marching along here. The Buried Melancholy of the Poet. One summer when he was still young, he stood at the window and wondered where they had gone, those women who sat by the ocean watching, waiting for something that would never arrive. The wind light against their skin, sending loose strands of hair across their lips. From what season had they fallen? From what idea of grace had they strayed? It was long since he had seen them in their lonely splendor, heavy in their idleness, enacting the sad story of hope abandoned. This was the summer he wandered out into the miraculous night, into the sea of dark, as if for the first time to shed his own light. But what he shed was the dark, what he found was the night. Clear in the September light, 
A man stands under a tree looking at a small house not far away. He flaps his arms as if he were a bird, maybe signaling someone we cannot see. He could be yelling, but since we hear nothing, he probably is not. Now the wind sends a shiver through the tree and flattens the grass. The man falls to his knees and pounds the ground with his fists. A dog comes and sits beside him. And the man stands once again flapping his arms. What he does has nothing to do with me. His desperation is not my desperation. I do not stand under trees and look at small houses. I have no dog. You can always get there from here. I'm going to drink a little water now. <sighs> a traveler returned to the country from which he had started many years before. When he stepped from the boat, he noticed how different everything was. There were once many buildings, but now there were few and each of them needed repair. In the park where he played as a child, dust-filled shafts of sunlight struck the tawny leaves of trees and withered hedges empty trash bags littered the grass. The air was heavy. He sat on one of the benches and explained to the woman next to him that he'd been away a long time, then asked her what season had he come back to. She replied that it was the only one left, the one they had all agreed on. The Gallows in the Garden. In the garden of the great house, they are building an immense gallows. The head of the great house, who wears a dark suit, which he believes shows him to great advantage, defends the gallows' size by saying that the executed will thus appear small in death. But his critics, whose taste in clothes can never match his, say that the huge gallows will only signify the importance of the hanged. Nonsense, explains the head of the great house. The gallows are more than the gallows, and the hanged are less than the hanged. Anything else is unthinkable. The triumph... No. I'm not going to read this one. I didn't even say the whole title. It's just, just well, maybe I will read it. <laughs> the Triumph of the Infinite. I got up in the night and went to the end of the hall. Over the door in large letters it said, this is the next life. Please come in. I opened the door. Across the room, a bearded man in a pale green suit turned to me and said, Better get ready. We're taking the long way. <laughs> now I'll wake up, I thought. But I was wrong. We began our journey over golden tundra and patches of ice. Then there was nothing for miles around, and all I could hear was my heart pumping and pumping so hard I thought I would die all over again. 
the mysterious arrival of an unusual letter. It had been a long day at work and a long ride back to the small apartment where I lived. When I got there, I flicked on the light and saw on the table an envelope with my name on it. Where was the clock? Where was the calendar? The handwriting was my father's, but he had been dead for 40 years. As one might, I began to think that maybe, just maybe, he was alive living a secret life somewhere nearby. How else to explain the envelope? To steady myself, I sat down, opened it, and pulled out the letter. Dear son, was the way it began. Dear son, and then nothing. Poem of the Spanish Poet. In a hotel room, Somewhere in Iowa, an American poet, tired of his poems, tired of being an American poet, leans back in his chair and imagines he is a Spanish poet. <laughs> an old Spanish poet, nearing the end of his life who walks to the Guadalquivir and watches the ships gray and ghostly in the twilight slip downstream. The little waves approaching the grassy bank where he sits whisper something he can't quite hear as they curl and fall. Now, what does the Spanish poet do? He reaches into his pocket, pulls out a notebook, and writes, Black fly, black fly, why have you come? Is it my shirt, my new white shirt with buttons of bone? Is it my suit, my dark blue suit? Is it because I lie here alone, under a willow, cold as stone? Black fly, black fly, how good you are to come to me now. How good you are to visit me here. Black fly, black fly, to wish me goodbye. The Enigma of the Infinitesimal. You've seen them at dusk, walking along the shore, seen them standing in doorways, leaning from windows, or straddling the slow-moving edge of a shadow. Lovers of the in-between, they are neither here nor there neither in nor out. Poor souls, they are driven to experience the impossible. Even at night, they lie in bed with one eye closed and the other open, hoping to catch the last second of consciousness and the first of sleep, to inhabit that no man's land, that beautiful place, to behold as only a god might, the luminous conjunction of nothing and all. My second sip of water. I usually have three. It's a 
wet bottle. A dream of travel comes down from the mountain, the cream-colored horse comes across dun fields and steps lightly into the house and stands in the bright living room cloud-like and silent. And now, without warning, the gray arm of the wind takes him away. I loved that horse, thought the poet. I could have loved anything, but I loved that horse. With him, I could have gone to the sea, the wrinkled, sorrowing sea, and who knows what I could have done there turned wind into marble, made stars shiver in sunlight. The emergency room at dusk. The retired commander was upset. His room in the castle was cold. So was the room across the hall and all the other rooms as well. He should never have bought this castle when there were so many other cheaper, warmer castles for sale. <laughs> but he liked the way this one looked, its stone turrets rising into the winter air, its main gate, even its frozen moat on which he thought someday he might ice skate, had a silvery charm. He poured himself a brandy and lit a cigar and tried to concentrate on other things, his many victories, the bravery of his men. But his thoughts swirled in tiny eddies, settling first here, then there, moving as the wind does from empty town to empty town. Once upon a cold November morning, I left the sunlit fields of my daily life and went down into the hollow mountain and there I discovered in all its chilly glory the glass castle of my other life. I could see right through it and beyond, but what could I do with it? It was perfect, irreducible, and worthless except for the fact that it existed. Provisional eternity. A man and a woman lay in bed. Just one more time, said the man. Just one more time. Why do you keep saying that, said the woman because I never want it to end, said the man. What don't you want to end, said the woman. This, said the man, this never wanting it to end. The street at the end of the world. Haven't we been down this this street before? I think we have. I think they move it every few years, but it keeps coming back <laughs> with its ravens and dead branches, its crumbling curbs, its lines of people just stepping from a landscape that goes blank the moment they leave it. And what of the walled city with its circling swallows and the sun setting behind it? Haven't we seen that before? And what of the ship about to set off for the Isle of Black Rainbows and Midnight Flowers, and the bearded tour guides waving us on? Yes, my dear, we have seen that too, but now you must hold my arm and close your eyes. An event about which no more need be said. I want to apologize ahead of time for this. <laughs> Peace. I was riding downtown in a cab 
with a prince who had consented to be interviewed but asked that I not mention him or his country by name. He explained that both exist secretly and their business is carried on in silence. He was tall, had a long nose beneath which was tucked a tiny mustache. He wore a pale blue shirt open at the neck and cream colored pants. I have no hobbies, he explained. My one interest is sex. It can be with a man or a woman, old or young, so long as it produces the desired result, which is to remind me of the odor of white truffles or the taste of candied violets in a floating island. Here, let me show you something. When I saw it, saw how big it was and what he'd done to it, I screamed and leaped from the moving cab. <laughs> One of the things about writing poetry is that often uh, you can be surprised by what you write. Uh, I mean, you say to yourself, hmm, wonder where that came from. In the case of the previous poem, I don't want to go there. <laughs> anyway, I'll move on. Um, well, I don't want to carry this reading on too long. I have to ch pick and choose now. A letter from Tegucigalpa. Dear Henrietta, since you were kind enough to ask why I no longer write, I shall do my best to answer you. In the old days, my thoughts, like tiny sparks, would flare up in the almost dark of consciousness and I would transcribe them. And page after page shone with a light that I called my own. I would sit at my desk amazed by what had just happened. And even as I watched, the lights fade and my thoughts become small, meaningless memorials in the afterglow of so much promise. I was still amazed, and when they disappeared as they inevitably did, I was ready to begin again, ready to sit in the dark for hours and wait for even a single spark, though I knew it would shed almost no light at all. What I had not realized then, but now know only too well, is that sparks carry within them the wish to be relieved of the burden of brightness, and that is why I no longer write, and why the dark is my freedom and my happiness. Mystery and Solitude in Topeka. Afternoon darkens into evening. A man falls deeper and deeper into the slow spiral of sleep, into the drift of it, the length of it, through what feels like mist and comes at last to an open door through which he passes without knowing why, then again without knowing why, goes to a room where he sits and waits while the room seems to close around him and the dark is darker than any he has known and he feels something forming within him without being sure what it is, its hold on him growing as if a story were about to unfold in which two characters, pleasure and pain, commit the same crime, the one that is his, that he will confess to again and again until it means nothing. In the afterlife, 
She stood beside me for years. Or was it a moment? I cannot remember. Maybe I loved her. Maybe I didn't. There was a house, and then no house. There were trees, but none remain. When no one remembers, what is there? You whose moments are gone, who drift like smoke in the afterlife, tell me something. Tell me anything. Futility in Key West. I was stretched out on the couch, about to doze off, when I imagined a small figure asleep on a couch identical to mine. Wake up, little man, wake up, I cried. The one you're waiting for is rising from the sea, wrapped in spume and soon will come ashore. Beneath her feet the melancholy garden will turn bright green and the breezes will be light as baby's breath. Wake up before this creature of the deep is gone and everything goes blank as sleep. How hard I try to wake the little man. How hard he sleeps. And the one who rose from the sea, her moment gone, how hard she has become, how hard those burning eyes, that burning hair. <coughs> Trouble in Pocatello. It was autumn. It was late in the day. A storm was coming. Flocks of birds were flying south. A pink and purple sunset stained the house. The wind gusted, branches tossed, leaves dropped like dead moths on a Cecil rug. I'm home, said the husband. Not again, said the wife. <laughs> The, the social worker and the monkey. Once I sat in a room with a monkey who told me he was not a monkey. I understood his anguish, being trapped in a body he detested. Sir, I said, I think I know what you are feeling, and I would like to help you. Treat me like a monkey, he said. It serves me right. Those little legs and awful hands. Night had fallen. A man who was staying at the Grand Hotel walked to the beach, lit a cigar, opened a black umbrella, and leaned back in a canvas beach chair holding the cigar in one hand and the umbrella in the other. I wanted to ask him, why the umbrella? But I was too timid. Then I heard him say, those little legs and awful hands, will I never be rid of them? I patted my legs then looked at my hands and knew that he had not meant me and certainly not himself, but maybe another, someone he might have hated or even loved. But down the beach, a woman wearing very large mittens was coming toward him <laughs> rapidly with baby steps. He jumped up from the beach chair, tossed his cigar, and with his umbrella began to run. He ran and ran, trying to escape as if he could ever escape.
Nocturne of the Poet Who Loved the Moon. I have grown tired of the moon, tired of its look of astonishment, the blue ice of its gaze, its arrivals and departures, of the way it gathers lovers and loners under its invisible wings, failing to distinguish between them. I have grown tired of so much that used to entrance me, tired of watching cloud shadows pass over sunlit grass, of seeing swans glide back and forth across the lake, of peering into the dark, hoping to find an image of a self as yet unborn. Let plainness enter the eye, Plainness, like a table on which nothing is set. A table that is not yet even a table. Two more. In the grand ballroom of the new eternity, they sway like drunks in delirious exile from sense, letting their blindness guide them ever further from what might have been theirs, letting their former selves fade and be lost in the dusk of forgetfulness, never to be regained, never to be more than an idea of once having been, so that the light which had been theirs is gone for good. And when the doctors come, it is too late. The shades above the city have already been drawn. The pockets of wind have been emptied. And the last poem. When I turned a hundred, I wanted to go on an immense journey, to travel night and day into the unknown until, forgetting my old self, I came into possession of a new self one that I might have missed on my previous travels. But the first step was beyond me. I lay in bed, unable to move, pondering as one does at my age, the ways of melancholy, how it seeps into the spirit, how it disincarnates the will how it banishes the senses to the chill of twilight, how even the best and worst intentions wither in its keep. I kept staring at the ceiling, then suddenly felt a blast of cold air, and I was gone. Thank you.